We do not have our media chat screens, but we have something else for you. We have a, a, the PowerPoint presentation on a sheet of paper in front of you. I would encourage you on Sunday morning, every Sunday, I put some of those out. Uh, maybe this might be the beginning of a good habit for us. But as we enter worship, there is a place on the side for those of you that wish to make notes. And um, so this is going to be a little bit different. I can see my PowerPoint, but you can't. And let's hope the technology works well uh, this morning. So one of the ordination questions that Phil Stepper answered this morning, do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? This is quite a task. It is one called upon for each of us to be peacemakers, to be united, to live our lives, and to function in the life of the church with utmost integrity, honesty, and purity. We often say the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Romans chapter 14, 19, I have a number of passages to share with you on these three ties. Paul says in Romans 14, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Let us make every effort. I shared with you before a statement that a judge made that has had a great impact upon my life, and it wasn't a judge that I had to stand in. But believe it or not, God even used the judges on television to play the part of the novel. But when I think of a piece, um, I, I remember a case where a mother was suing her daughter, forget what it was about. And in so many cases, it's not always about if there's any issue, but there are deeper issues there. And what ended up in this situation was that this woman was very upset that her daughter did not baptize her granddaughter that the mother chose, for whatever reasons, not to baptize the child. That was the real reason. That was the real issue. And I remember the judge making the following statement to the grandmother of this little girl. She said, do you want to be right, or do you want a relationship? And that all looks stuck with me. But for those of you that have known me for the last six years, I hope you maybe not hope, but know that you picked up on the fact that I like to be right. <laughs> and I think most of us do. But as God calls us to peace, being peaceful, there are times where we have to ask ourselves that question. Do you want to be right? Is it important for you to, that everyone knows that you're right? Or do you want a relationship? I hope and pray that you and I always choose to continue that relationship. The writer of Hebrews has made every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Again, this exhortation to do all that we can to live at peace. And sometimes that means walking away. Sometimes, I want to be careful how I phrase this, but sometimes even giving in when we are right and not having the last word, not having to prove that we're right for the peace of your family, for the peace of the church, for the peace of the nation. God calls us to be peacemakers. God calls particularly those of you who are men and women who serve on procession to be peacemakers in the life of the church. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, if it is possible, 
as far as it depends on you to live in peace with everyone. It is no surprise that some of you know people, maybe even your family, maybe your neighbor, people who do not want peace. Always, as I say, stirring the pot. Always causing conflict. Always hitting the buttons of others. And I love this passage by Paul. Because I sometimes get asked the question, somebody tells me a story about a conflict and an issue, and, and asks, you know, how do we handle this? And, and we handle it biblically. And this passage gives us a sense of relief and comfort and consolation because Paul says it is possible as far as it depends on you live at peace. And so sometimes there are situations with people where we do all that we can to be at peace with them. We extend the olive branch. We say we're sorry. We apologize. And people refuse to accept that forgiveness. They refuse to accept that apology. You know, Jesus told his disciples that when they enter the city or town, that they are to bless the people in that city or town. And Jesus said, if they receive your blessing, then you stay and minister to them. However, if they don't receive your blessing, it comes back upon you. Shake the dust off your sandals as a statement against them. And move on. I mean, how hard it is sometimes for us to move on from whatever it is that we are experiencing. But Paul says, as much as it depends upon you. And recognize that there'll be situations where people choose not to be in peace with you. But graciously, we continue to interact with them, to love them, to pray for them, and be open. First Thessalonians 5, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Always strive to do what is good for each other. I've shared with you before the statement that I think is equally true that to return to return good for good is human. You know, I help you move furniture at your house and you help me move furniture at my house. To return good for good is human. To return evil for what someone does is good. That's a statement. In our lives. Satan does that. It's called revenge. It's called bitterness. It's called, well, Pastor, I may forgive, but I will never forget. Sounds familiar? To return good for good is you know, humans, to return evil for good. Is of Satan, and re to return good when evil has been done to you. That's the challenge, isn't it? To not take revenge, to be a peacemaker, to be willing to have a relationship rather than to be right. So I'm going to share a story of peace has to do with the holidays, I think all of us perhaps could um, sympathize with this woman named Lucinda and identify with her. It's a true story. Lucinda Norman writes in her experience Christmas shopping at the mall. Now, unfortunately now with Amazon and other things, right, we don't do as much shopping at malls that people used to. But people had been pushing, elbowing, and cutting in front of her all day. And during the 10 minute extra 10% off special, one woman grabbed a lace tablecloth from her hands, looked her in the eye, 
and he said, mine. She named it back in one. By 4 p.m., her mood was belligerent. She met some friends at a mall restaurant, flagged down the server. She barked, I need hot tea now. The waitress snapped back, I'm not your server. Wait your turn. Lucinda responded, Lady, I've been waiting my turn all day. Bring me some tea. But the waitress ignored her. And a few moments later, a friendly young man came to the table and he said, I'm Bob, your waiter. And he took their orders. Lucinda watched Bob as he helped the rude waitress with her tray. He greeted the other customers and staff with a smile on his face, and in the midst of the hurried customers and the chaos of the season, he had a polite, unhurried atmosphere of calm. And when he refilled her tea, Lucinda noticed a silver ring on his hand, made of connected letters, the name Jesus. And then she writes, from that moment my attitude changed. This young man's example had reminded me of the peace that Christ came to bring. And for the rest of the day, Lucinda enjoyed shopping. She even opened doors for others, let others in front of her in the checkout line in an atmosphere of peace. I'm not always that patient at the grocery store. I remember shopping at Walmart in Canada one year where my daughter lived with her husband and kids. And I remember getting in line and I only had one or two items and there was a lady in front of me who had a big cart full of items. And so I kind of walked a little bit over to the side to get into her eyesight. She tried very, very hard not to see me. <laughs> kind of shuffled my feet, <clears throat> ripped my voice a little bit. Her eyes fixed. We do need the peace of Jesus Christ. Secondly, unity. And uh, I'm going to talk a minute or two about unity because there are three minutes misunderstandings about what unity really means. The church in Corinth, they were having problems with unity. 1 Corinthians 1 10, if you have the Jesus, you could look. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. What was happening in the church in Corinth was there was a popularity contest. And people would say, I was baptized by Jesus. I was baptized by John. I was baptized by Jesus. And there became such a division in the life of the church that it affected their ministry. And the Apostle Paul, before he visits the church in Corinth, says something that probably Every father or mother of children or grandchildren has said, and I'm paraphrasing Paul here, obviously, but the attitude that Paul has is it's coming to the church according to deep issues. Don't make me pull this car. <laughs> so we will turn around and go right back. Paul says concerning the division, and later as we talk about purity and the sexual immorality, more immorality at Corinth, Paul says, you fix that before I come. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but Paul says, either you fix it, or I'm going to fix it. Some of you in my Bible study have heard the story of a wedding that did years ago, and the pew was, had a, a bow on it and some flowers for family members. And before the servants, I noticed a young girl sitting in the middle of that pew with her grandparents. And so I went to one of the ushers and I said, Excuse me, who's that? Who's that young lady? Oh, that's the friend of one of the ushers. 
I said, well, she can't sit there. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, that's a special feeling for her. And I said, either you can talk to her and ask her to move, or I'll talk to her and ask her to move. Unity. What is unity? At its best, unity is motivated by love, nurtured in genuine relationships, and gives the freedom to participate. Conformity, on the other hand, is the act of matching attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors to group norms. How many of you know people that are very wishy-washy about all things? And you can tell them a story, and they'll say, yeah, I, I agree with that. And then somebody else will tell a story in a different way, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with you. I agree with you. Conformity is being moved in an area of our relationships where we follow what everyone else is doing. Now, as Presbyterians, we do not always agree with one another. As Christians, we do not always agree with one another. And I know Christians who will live their lives, and some leaders who live their lives, with the attitude, I'm going to go along to get along. Now we think on the surface that sounds really good, that sounds really mature. But you know, as the body of Christ, we're called as individuals to express our own opinions, to express our own views. And in the spirit of Christ, we may not always agree with one another, but in the spirit of unity, we affirm that person's right to that feeling. Again, the only right. If you want a relationship, the unity of the church must be protected. There are two extremes. You know, people who always take the opposite side. I, I've known people over the years that you say it's black, it's white. You say it's up, they say it's down. And so there are people who will take the opposite view. And for those of you who are parents and grandparents, here's a little bit of secret psychology. You use reverse psychology. <clears throat> Honey, you don't want to go to bed now. Or you give them a choice. Would you like me to read this book or that book before I go to bed? But there are people that are always disagreeing with others. And then there are others who always go along. And they don't express their opinion. They don't express their view. And in leadership in the life of the church, that, that kind of puts the kibosh sometimes on good ideas because people are afraid to express that. Paul says in Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In the kingdom of God, we are united. In the kingdom of God, no one has any greater standing than anyone else. We are all equal. Christopher, I have said to Session, as you express your opinion, Christopher, your opinion means no less than any other elder around this table. But your opinion means no more than anyone else around this table. Speaking of unity, I came across this interesting thing. You all know how newspapers mess up things all the time. And this is a true story in the Santee County Commissioner. Um, not sure what state that is. But they had printed an article of someone who was running for office. And when it came to the family supporting this individual for 
trial. They put in the newspaper that this person received 10% support of their families. In the Cambridge, Minnesota, that's it. Cambridge, Minnesota Star, Sunday County Commissioner Tom Cagle. This is what the newspaper wrote, probably on page 10, right in small print at the bottom. Sunny County Commissioner Tom Dale has 100% support from his family, not 10%, as was stated in last week's article on Dale's announcement to seek re-election. Chris, you know about elections and support for people. Finally, the response to further peace unity and purity of the church. Moral purity, we usually think of sexual purity, but it means more than that. It means integrity, honesty, purity in heart and in mind and in spirit. And so as a session, as members of Westminster, we are to promote not only the peace and the unity, but also the purity of the life of the church. So years ago, in one of our denominational conflicts about a controversial issue, the problem and the issue of peace and unity came up. And I had a very wise elder. Her name is Drina, and she made this comment years ago, I think it's so true. She says, without purity, without purity, there can be no unity or peace. I shared with you all the story of the keyboardist who having an affair with daughter in the life of the church. And because that session failed to deal with that issue, there was no peace in that church. And there was no Christian unity in the church. You see how they're linked up? They're all very important. First Timothy says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sin of others. Keep yourselves pure. One of the most challenging scriptures is the scripture where God's word says, Be holy as I am holy. Be pure as I am pure. And it's not only in deed, but it's in thought and in words. May our words be filled with purity. Yes. as we have an impact on the world around us. <laughs> Paul says in Philippians 2, do everything without grumbling or arguing. How that hurts. That resembles me. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. I propose a New Year's resolution for all of us, and we're going to keep each other accountable. No more grumbling or complaining. In the spirit of love, we hold each other accountable. You know, grumbling and complaining is contagious. Not as contagious as COVID or RSV. But think about it. Think about the last time you were in a group of people and someone started off the conversation complaining or grumbling. And before they get two or three sentences now, guess what we're doing? When there's a break in the conversation, we're thinking of adding our two cents. Let's make a commitment this new year. And more importantly, I would love for one another. Let's call each other on that. So remember pastors Rob Sermon in the first Sunday? We made a, we made a commitment. No more grumbling, complaining, or arguing. Finally, some questions. I have the gentleman's name written down there at the end. These are not mine, but I think these questions are very important that we close. Are we being desensitized by the present evil world? I think yes. 
Do things that once shocked us now pass us by with little notice? Yes. Have our sexual ethics slackened? Yes. Where do our minds wander when we have no duties to perform? What are we reading? Are there books or magazines or files in our libraries or computers that we want no one else to see? And what are we watching? How many hours did we spend watching TV during the week? How many adult rapes did we watch last week? How many murders? How many did we watch with children and grandchildren through? And then finally, how many chapters of the Bible did we read last week? Friends, as we go forth into this new world, we do not know what the future holds, but we do know the hope the future. Let us make a commitment to one another and a commitment to promise and resolution to God that we will seek to pursue peace, unity, and purity. Amen.